Leo kuondoka majaliwa. Mji wa raha. Sahau kila tabu. Ukifika nenda buguruni. Uambiwe karibu mjini. Uwe uji kwa biasha. Usijifanye we mtasha. Kaanalo kwa akili. Ulisome mara mbili. Uwe. Mpaka mwisho wa safari. Shairi langu la pili linaitwa Akuilina. Nadhani wote tunamfahamu Akuilina. Nimeliandika nikiwa na mwana huyo Akuilina. Walikoka moto jikoni mwanga uangaze. Hasira zilijaa pomoni maandamano yaanze. Chakula kipikwe kunini, shibe iwakumbatie. Haki itapatikana lini wenye nguvu wawaambie. Lakini hata hatukuona moto. Alipaa juu kama moshi na kupotea. Huku tukimwangalia. Tuliangaliana huku tunalia. Mchana kwa upe daladala alipanda. Kenda wapi akilina? Kumbe mwisho wake mautini. Pumzi ilifyonzwa risasini. Kenda wapi akilina? Ujana leo usamini umenyauka. Mwangaza watumaini kupauka. Kenda wapi akilina? Mbona jinale hamtaji? Mwenda mwendo wa kibajaji. Yuko wapi demokrasia? Katiba mpya kutupatia. Yuko wapi akilina? Amebaki kuwa jina. Shairi langu la tatu linaitwa Mimi ni mwanamke. <laughs> Mimi ni mwanamke. Waniuliza siri ya urembo. Kujamini kwangu ndio nembo. Niwe mwandamba kama fimbo ama mnene kama tembo. Roho yangu ina wimbo. Mimi ni mwanamke. Mwanamke ni mimi. Kicheko kwangu hakiishi. Changamoto hazintishi. Njoo kwangu le mapishi. Nikupoze kwa maandishi. Nafsi yako ipate ishi. Mimi ni mwanamke. Mwanamke ni mimi. Si ufichi uzuri wangu. Nalipenda umbo langu. Na inua kichwa changu. Na ipaza sauti yangu. Kwangu patamu ondoa chungu. Mimi ni mwanamke. Mwanamke ni mimi. Mbona huelewi? Furaha sipangiwi. Vya kwangu havichezewi. Si malaika si mchawi. Vya bure misigawi. Mimi ni mwanamke. Mwanamke ni mimi. Vizuri vyangu na vijua. Macho ya ngaayo kama jua. Mwanya uvuti yao ni kikenua. Neema. Neema ni igawayo kwa kila hatua. Fadhila kwangu ni kama mvua. Mimi ni mwanamke. Mwanamke ni mimi. Niliburuzwa wakadhani sitaamka. Walinidharau tena walinicheka. Msibani walikuja na mikeka. Wakasema sasa mwisho wake umefika. Shetani kamjue, shetani kamjua kwake hatotoka. Mimi ni mwanamke, mwanamke ni mimi. Kwa shairi njoo tukae mbinguni. Utulizane kwangu kama peponi. Uitoe sumu iliyojaa moyoni. Ujifunze kushika akili mkononi. Sala na dua zisikuache kinywani. Mimi ni mwanamke, mwanamke ni mimi. Leo hii nasherekea. Mengi moyoni kusimulia. Wanamke wangu najivunia. Ninangara siwezi fifia. Kwani mimi ni malkia? Mimi ni mwanamke, mwanamke ni mimi. Waniuliza siri ya urembo, kujithamini kwangu ndio nembo. Niwe mwembamba kama fimbo au mnene kama tembo. Roho yangu ina wimbo. 
na kuambia mimi ni mwanamke na mke mimi asanteni That's not how we do it in Africa, Germany. Do you know how to do it? Do you know how to do it? Yeah? Good. Kwa kweli, na chweza kusema ni kwamba, hakika Esther neno tuisikia. Neno zita, neno zito kwa raha kapambia. Neno zito kwa mkawa hisia katutupia, hakika kwa furaha nyingi ametuachia Keynote speaker ladies and gentlemen I would like to invite Anthony Onuba of the African Writers Conference to come up and say give an introduction of the AWC Now this man before you has experience in motion pictures and the film industry. He is the founder of Writer Space Africa as well as African Writers Development Trust. And not only that, he is the vice chairman of the Association of Nigerian Authors. And he has quite a number of books under his belt. One of them is Lavender, another one is Amanda's Amanda's Crimes, I can't read my own handwriting, and also a book called Reflections. Karim San. Good morning, everyone. As introduced, my name is Antonio Nuba. Um, I'm from Nigeria, my first time in Tanzania. Yes. And I will tell you something coincidental before I start. Sometime in 2003, I think, when I was compiling my first anthology, a collection of poems, there was a poem I titled With Love from Dar es Salaam. That was the title of the poem 20 years ago. And 20 years later, Dar es Salaam is showing me that love, which I wrote about. It's a beautiful city, it's a beautiful country. The people are very kind. Very, very kind, very humble, and very nice. <laughs> so, I'll just give you a summary of the African Writers' Conference. Um, I'll start by talking about this quote. It's a quote by a renowned scholar and explorer, Ibn Battuta. And it's about traveling. And he said, traveling, it leaves you speechless and turns you into a storyteller. The beauty of a creative is the ability to travel in our minds. We travel to the future, we travel to the past, travel and create things, bring them into words, bring them into poetry, into spoken word, bring them into, give them life. People read this and they are enlightened, they are inspired, they are transformed. And the story of the African Writers' Conference is that of travel. One of the things we did when we began, as far back as 2017, was to think about, was to travel into the future, into a world where African writers are united, where there are opportunities for African writers, where there's the chance to network, where there's a chance to meet new people, the chance to exchange books, exchange stories, exchange cultures, as the case may be. And that was why we came up with the idea of having a conference for African writers. But because of the mobility challenges in Africa, we decided the conference should be rotated around African countries, around African regions. So when we started in 2018, the first conference was in West Africa, in Nigeria. 2019, the second conference was in East Africa, in Kenya. Last year was Southern Africa, in Zambia. This year, we came back to East Africa. I mean, East Africa is beautiful, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, we came back here to Tanzania, and next year we'll be going to Central Africa. The idea is to enable people to be able to, to experience the conference 
For example, you have very good road networks in East Africa. So East African um, writers who probably cannot afford to fly can take the road, can come by train. The same in West and Central Africa. This is the idea behind the African Writers Conference. And it's because of people like Nahida. I mean, her name has mentioned a lot, but really, Nahida is a very, very hardworking person. Because of people like Nahida and the others from Writer Space Africa, that the conference is here live. In fact, in all honesty, the first conference in Nigeria in 2018 was possible because of Nahida. It, it, Because for those who don't know, the Nigerian scene is a lot more different than it is here. If Nahida had not done the intervention she did in 2018, we were on the verge of cancelling the conference. Already we had cancelled it in 2017 because we couldn't just hold it. We, could, uh, we didn't get enough support as we wanted. But from 2018, when that happened up until now, we have made it a tradition to continue. Even if it is um, low budget or whatever be the case, we must hold the conference. This was why last year, during the COVID um, era, we decided to make it a hybrid conference, but physical. We want that story. We want it recorded. We want, it to, we want people to know that we were here. We came, and people came together because of what we did. And so we made it a hybrid conference. We live streamed and had um, an audience of about 50 people physically. That's what even brought the idea of live streaming. So you see, our journey continues. Today, we are live streaming the entire conference from beginning to the end because of our journey. And as our journey continues into the future, we don't know where it will lead. We hope that our dreams can be achieved. We hope that even the new generation, the younger ones, can take over. We don't know how long we are staying on Earth. But at least we have left what words. We have left, we have left our footprints. We have left our hearts. Because in the end, all of this comes from our hearts. Everything that we do comes from our heart. And it, is, it only makes sense if everything we do is from our heart. Thank you very much once again, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Asante sana, Anthony. Asante sana na karibu. Um, I'd just like to ask people to move a bit forward to the front seats. If you'd like to come forward, kidogo. Just to fill in the seats, zaukundele kidogo. There is a lot of space in the center row. If people would like to just, you know, spread around a little kidogo. Yeah? I mean, the reason is we want it to look like it's, you know, Pamegia, yeah. And the when you are me, yeah, So you just spread, spread around Kidogo. Asante san. In this room, we have a mixture. We have a mixture of the old and the new. As I said, you have to know where you've come from, to know where you are, to get the strength to move forward. I look around and I see people who have contributed to literature in Tanzania, people who have been part of the process, they have written, and I see people who aspire to become writers. I see poets, I see musicians, I see people of the performing arts in this room. There are people like Fatima Alou, who's worked with the history of people like Siti Binti Saad, being recorded and being there for everybody to savor. There are people like Sandra who uses word. 
sound of you, I would say, as an AK-47. You know, her words are bullets of reality. She goes where people dare not go, where they are afraid to go. There are people like Lubacha, up-and-coming writer as well. But we also have in this room a person who never ages, and that is Richard Mabala. <laughs> Richard Mabala wrote a book about Mabala, the farmer. I'm not saying Mabala is stubborn. No, he's not. But he wrote about a character called Mabala, the farmer. And then Mabala currently is into technology. So he's moved from the past to the present. And he's still moving forward to the future. And we can learn a lot from Richard Mabala. There's a lot that I can say about him. Well, he grew up in the UK, but he's from Tabora. He's a Myamwezi. He's married with two children. And he started out as a teacher, teaching African literature. And I remember when I was here at the university, we used to get inspired during the Liberation Week. And we would take all our poems to Richard Mabala to read first, to see whether they were feisty enough, whether they had enough fire for the Liberation Week. I remember very clearly. So that is where Richard Mabala has come from. In him is a rich history. He has written for children and adults. And I remember I worked with Mabala on a multimedia project called Sara that sought to give rights to the African child, rights to education, rights to um, information on adolescent sexuality, the right to participate in decision-making, the right to health. And that is Mabala. I can say a lot, but we are behind time. I would take all day. Richard Mabala, Karib. He is our keynote speaker for today. Assalamu alaikum. To stand before you like this is uh, quite a frightening honor. Because uh, I know that in this room there are practitioners and critics and writers who are far more worthy than I am to actually do this job. Eh? But I thank you for giving this honor and I will do my best to uh, do it justice. Na ningependa kumshukuru Esther. Ingawa alisababisha mtu mwingine aniangalie kwa jicho la pembeni kwa sababu alivonivutia na mimi nasema mimi ni mwanamke maana kwa jamaa. Oh jamaa vipi? Eh? Eh? But uh, I was touched particularly by her second poem. Um about a, a pivotal moment in uh, the history of our democracy. Uh, and I remembered uh, the phrase, which I think I may come back to, if you want to tell the truth, write fiction or write poetry. If you want to tell lies, write history. And. Uh, Starting from that, I would like to start with a quotation from uh, Franz Fanon, because although there are some of us old people here, um, what I see here is a new generation. And uh, Fanon, in the Wretched of the Earth, said, each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission Fulfill it or betray it. Now that is quite a heavy mission. Kila kizazi. Mbacho kenapo ibuka hakifamiki. Lazame itambue in a mission gani katika wandishi wake, maishi yake, kuitimize au kuisaliti. And that is the future of African literature. Do we fulfill it? Or do we betray it? 
But to begin with, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go back to the unending African debate because you can't talk about the future of African literature without asking what is African literature. Uh, and I'd like to start with our new uh, Nobel Prize winner, Abdul Razak Ghana. Those of you who follow me or other people on Twitter will have seen that yesterday there was a furious debate. Who is he? Is he Zanzibari? Is he Tanzanian? Is he British? Does he want to be Tanzanian? Does he want to be Zanzibari? Uh, why do we remember him today when yesterday we probably would have called him Kibaraka or Mabeberu? Yeah, so yesterday he was a puppet of the imperialists. Today he is our writer. Which is good. And I fully support it. But if, if you... Uh, I think it, it raises the debate on, on what is African literature. He was born in Zanzibar. Yes, he grew up in Zanzibar. He left Zanzibar at the age of 18. And he has spent the rest of his life in the UK. He got his education, I think his higher education in the UK, and became a, a professor in um, post-colonial literatures. He has written many novels, most of them, uh, I will be honest, I only started reading his first novel yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> he is not well known in Tanzania, although now we celebrate him. Um, he left as a refugee and also to get education because of persecution. And partly his persecution was because his origins were a bit different from the origins of the majority of the Tanzanian people. And when he left in 1968, he was only able to return 16 years later to see his father shortly before his father died. Uh, and he wrote in his tweet, I dedicate this Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize to Africa and Africans and to all my readers. How much is he a part of African literature? Why do we say that he is a part of African literature? In his case, I think it's probably easier, uh, but I will give you one or two other cases which are a bit more complicated. Um, there is uh, Aminata... Horna. Uh, she was the daughter of someone who became a minister in Sierra Leone, so she was born Sierra Leonean. Her father was hanged, uh, they said for treason, but I think it was probably because he exposed the corruption in the government. Uh, and she, she grew up in Scotland, she married a Scottish person or an English person, I'm not sure which. Um, and, for example, she has written her novel called The Hired Man, which is set in Croatia. And she said, I don't understand why this novel is in the African section of novels. So the book is nothing about Africa at all. And she has never been in Africa since she was four. Although she has written a very powerful um, um, history of her father's life. You have uh, Helen Oyeyemi, who wrote a book called Bay, Boy Snowbird, which is set in New England, the United States. Oyeyemi is now British, but she was originally Nigerian, or her family was. Was, was Nigerian. Her family moved to the United Kingdom when she was four. And so on. And there are a lot of these days. Are they African writers? Does genetics uh, decide who an African writer is? Or geography? Or the themes they write about? And then if it's the themes they write about, you have a book like uh, the Constant Gardener by uh, John Le Carre, which is a very powerful novel, which was actually banned in, uh, about um, the life and times of Daniel Arap Moy, 
and uh, the ravages of HIV and AIDS during that time due to decisions that were made and the dictatorship of the time. He's British, he wrote about Africa. Of course, I don't think John O'Carry is an African writer. Uh, but do the themes contribute to the decision of whether you are an African writer or not? Is it the language? There are many people, and I communicated with a former professor uh, when I was preparing this, this, um, this, this talk, uh, Professor Senkoro, who was in the Swahili department here, and he said, as far as I'm concerned, African literature is literature written in African languages. Not English, not French, not Portuguese, uh, but written in African languages. And then, uh, if you go to the airport, even here, and some of the bookshops, in the African literature section, and I have complained about this, you'll find a whole series of books written by Wazungu about Africa. Most of them who only came to Africa for a short time or lived for a short time or they fell in love with the Maasai or something. Um, which is fine, I'm very happy she fell in love with the Maasai. But uh, is that really African literature? So we have a problem of definition. But at the same time, when I was arguing with people about this on Twitter yesterday, I did a little bit of research, and, and I'd like to take the example of Isabel Allende, uh, who wrote The House of the Spirits and many other novels. She, she was related to Salvador Allende, the president of Chile, who was overthrown and uh, killed by the dictator Pinochet, and she, she went into exile and became an American citizen, she wrote all her books in America, but nearly all of them are written about Chile or Latin America. So I was interested to see that uh, in the last 10 years, on the one hand, she's been given the US Presidential Medal of Honor as a distinguished American citizen, and on the other hand, uh, she was uh, given the Chilean prize or literature. So although she is no longer Chilean, and she continues to live in the United States, Chile recognizes her as one of their great And so having done that sort of rather strange journey, my argument is, so what? Do we have to have an absolute definition of what is African literature? And my argument today is actually there is no African literature, there are African literatures. It is plural, it is no longer... I think in the 1960s, and many others, and they didn't agree, um, but Achebe Ngugi said later, it was, they realized that suddenly all the people there were talking in English and writing in English. Shaban Robert, the great Swahili poet, had not even been invited. So African literature was squeezed into a smaller definition, um, whereas in fact we need to, to go far beyond that. And I think that will help us to decide what the future of African literature is. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm also an unrepentant socialist and Marxist to some extent. And so I would argue that one of the problems that we are facing now is we keep on thinking about Africa as one homogeneous whole. And so we have a big argument about well, Taye Selassie and Chimamanda Adichie and Maaza Mengiste and all the, the writers and, and Jennifer Nansubuga, uh, all these writers are living outside Africa. So are they African? And every time, and, and, and uh, they complain. Um, Tai Selassie said, you know, when she goes to talk at a conference, the first question is, do you see yourself as an African writer? They don't establish her bona fide credentials to be called an African. <coughs> so I think we have to look at it as an issue of class. 
And this is why there is a big difference between the first generation of African writers and the new generation, which has really come up very strongly in the last 10 years, and which is why I think the future of Africa. Chinua Achebe. His father was a teacher, and his mother was a vegetable farmer. Tembeni Usmane, fisherman. Shoinka's father was a primary school teacher, and his mother was a uh, petty trader. She had a shop. Guge hmm? Wadiongo, his father was a farmer who was stripped of his land and became a squatter. Huh? So they came from a generation that lived basically in the village rather than in the town, and from a class which saw the world from the bottom up. And this has influenced their writing, I think, for all the years in which they have been writers. Now if you compare it to, uh, and so the themes were very clear as well. Also, they grew up under colonial rule. So it was the themes of colonialism, the evils of colonialism, the struggle against colonialism, cultural imperialism, the struggle against cultural imperialism, the resurrection of African tradition, the impact of colonial and neo-colonial education, and the betrayal of the freedom struggle. I finished reading A Grain of Wheat again for the first time for about 10 years. And it's to me, it's still one of the most powerful novels I've ever read. Before that, I reread God's Bits of Wood. I'm an old man now. Yeah. And again, I think it's one of the most powerful novels that have been written. They're both outstanding novels. But it was quite clear what their aim was. So when a new generation comes in, which uh, come from a different kind of, uh, a different kind of class, then you see a reaction. So Chimamanda Adichie, her father is a professor, and her mother was an administrator. At Taye Selassie, both her parents were doctors. She was born in London and moved to the USA. Aminata Puna, as I said, her father was a minister. In Yavanga Wainaina, his father was a, uh, the manager of an agricultural company. Yagyasi, homegoing, her father was a professor, and her mother was a nurse. So the kind of environment in which they grew up, the formative years, their formative years, inevitably were different. And this explains why there is a big difference between that generation and this generation. But secondly, also, when they looked at it, and I think this is really important, oh, I'm an old man, is that uh, they could see... Uh, the weaknesses or the weak points in the original belief of the first generation of writers. And that's why Chimamanda wrote about the dangers of a single story. Africa is not just about colonialism, neocolonialism, poverty, HIV and AIDS, um, and so on. And I personally, I learned that uh, a long time ago. I came to, uh, to Tanzania in 1973 as a volunteer. And then somehow I never left. <laughs> <laughs> and I was fortunate to be accepted as a Tanzanian citizen in 1982. Uh, but there was a Danish volunteer uh, who I lived next to. And he went around taking pictures. This was in 1973 taking pictures of all the skyscrapers he could find. <coughs> so I asked him, why are you doing that? He said, because the only pictures anyone in Europe ever sees are pictures of mud huts or with grass roofs and, and so on. That, uh, so people think that is all that Africa is. And Adichie, uh, she made the same point. Um, she said, a professor who once told me that my novel was not authentically African, um, now I was quite willing to contend that there were a number of things wrong with the novel, that it had failed in a number of places, but I had not quite imagined that it had failed at achieving something called African authenticity. In fact, I didn't know what African authenticity was. The professor told me that my characters were too much like him, an educated a middle-class man, my characters drove cars, they were not starving, therefore they were not. 
authentically African. That is the danger of a single story. That uh, there are middle class Africans. We have a big middle class of Africans. Eh? You have Feza boys and Feza girls, just as much as you have Shuli Zakata and Azawukata. Hmm? <laughs> They're all a part of our culture, our life. And that's why, if we are going to be able to accommodate all these different uh, heterogeneity in our society, we need to have different kinds of literature, different literatures to be able to express different aspects of our lives. And we can't expect a writer to encapsulate the whole of African identity in one novel. That is actually unfair to the writer. You can question whether they have um, presented an authentic portrait, not just of the age and everything, but overall, whether the characters make sense and so on. But you can't say they, oh, you failed because you didn't talk about the peasants. Well, I don't know anything about the peasants. I didn't grow up in a peasant culture. Eh? And so on. Um, and so Maza Mengiste also wrote that it seems that every new writer with any remote connection to the continent of Africa, either willingly or unwillingly, has first to wrestle with this question of identity before talking about what should matter most, their book. And the second thing I think which the new generation of writers has rebelled against to some extent, not completely, because any writer who writes has something they want to say. But I think it was more in evidence in the earlier African writing. Eh? Chino Achebe saw the writer's role as a teacher. And it was a teacher after his wife, who was a teacher, asked the students to write a, 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 an essay about, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this, uh, the Hamatan, Hamatan, Hamatan. The Nigerians will correct me here. And the boy said, uh, no, I don't want to write about that. That's Bush. But if you ask me to write about winter, I will write a thing, because winter is European. And actually, you know, we have the same problem here. You know, people don't talk about Kipupwe. They talk about winter, but Kipupwe is completely different from winter. Masika is different from spring, and so on. But still, we categorize ourselves into um, something that is, is not part of, of, of our reality. So, Achebe was a teacher. And then I've often asked myself, what happened? Because he wrote one, two, three, four novels, and then suddenly Achebe went completely silent. For a long time he wrote essays, but no novel. And I believe it's because he thought that as a teacher he had failed because Achebe was Biafran. And when he saw the atrocities and the horror of the Biafran War, his, cre his creativity dried up until he came to, to the, new, the new thinking, which is, and I'm sure you've heard this before, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So this became Achebe's new um, rationale for being a writer. He would be the historian of the lions. But I would argue that even that is, needs to go a bit further. Because you have the hunter, and you have the lions, and you have the antelopes and the warthogs. So until the warthogs and the antelopes get their historian, uh, history will always praise the lions. The lions are strong, they're big, they're king of the jungle, and so on. And that's why one of the new books I'm writing is a set of short stories, animal short stories, modern animal short stories, in Ghana is a Tanya book. Uh, Panya Buk are, are the edible rats, but also they are the rats who have been trained to, uh, to uh, identify mines and they're used in Mozambique and Vietnam and Angola and various other places. They're trained in Sokwini University here and now also they've been trained to identify TB. So one rat can do the work of a laboratory, one rat in one hour can do the work of a laboratory for a whole week. 
They are the proletariat of the animal kingdom. Uh, so they also need their historians because uh, they are not adequately identified. Mm -hmm. So we have this class, the Timonandas and the others, um, who have been writing fantastic novels. Uh, they call themselves Afropolitan, or which is really cosmopolitan with an African flavor. Mm -hmm. And that's what writers are across the world as well. The, the, the best-known writers, they are cosmopolitan. Eh? They're known across the world. Isabel Allende is Chilean. Eh? But uh, she's known, her books have been translated into 65 languages or something. Hmm? Abdul Razak, now his books will be translated into every, every language in the world. Uh, he is cosmopolitan. He belongs to a broader society, but with an African base. But, although they wrote this, and uh, they've written these, many of these, people then started questioning them and attacking them. Who are you writing for? You have European publishers or American publishers. Um, your books are sold in Europe and America. Uh, Abdul Razak, I'm not sure whether you can even get his novel in Tanzania this moment in time. I went to Kukina Nyota yesterday. It's not there. Hmm? We don't even know about him, but some, um, some people out there, they know about him and they, they know he's a good writer. Um, but is it fair to ask people this question? And so this is why I would like to talk about the diversity of African literatures. The first thing is the issue of oral versus written. The, the, the riches of oral literature have not really been captured. And Okot Bitek said this was because the people who actually copied down the traditional stories were missionaries. And the missionaries were mainly interested in the moral or the message of the story. So the excitement of the story, the beauty of the language, the acting out and all the other things, they were all set aside. So you just had very simple stories. And in the end, even the stories had, <coughs> had a moral as the title. I see, So there wasn't even any point in reading the story, since you already know what it um, was. Okot's mother was a, a famous traditional storyteller. And this gives me another another take on what is African literatures. Um, he wrote a book called Hair and Hornbill to try and write uh, with the vibrancy of the, of the oral literature, even when writing it in English. <coughs> and a group in Mombasa decided to act out one of the stories from the, from the book. And they prepared, and then it was banned. The play was banned because it went against African culture. An African story from an African storyteller translated into English, acted out, was then banned because it was against African culture. Actually, I think it was against Christian and Muslim culture because it was quite open about issues of sex. Uh, but the, the controllers of our culture and decide whether it is African or it's not African. Here in Tanzania, if you write a novel in Swahili, it has to go to a brother like Swahili to say, yes, this is proper Swahili. So where is the creativity of the language? If you start playing with the language, will it be allowed to be published? So there is a whole set of gatekeepers still about, and me, probably that's one reason why oral literature is not given the, the prominence it should do. Secondly, there are thousands of books in African languages. How many do we know? Apart from the set books on the syllabus, Wangapi Mesoma Riwaya Kiswahili. 
Hacho vile hivyo ambavyo na lazima usome darasani. Wangapi umesoma riwaya ya Kiswahili? Sio wengi. Hmm? Kwa Kiswahili, eh? You have Hausa novels, Igbo novels, you have novels in Pidgin. I remember reading a Ken Sarawiwa novel called Soldier Boy, written entirely in Pidgin English eh, before he was hanged by Tanya Bacha. Eh? So we have, and I remember when I was here at the university in the 1980s, a famous European critic came called Bernd Linfors. And uh, he was saying, well, you know, the problem is there aren't really any, uh, any Tanzanian writers. Hmm? So there in the room, there was Penina Mlama, Ibrahim Hussein, Kesla Habi, Amanda Amandina Lehamba, a whole, a whole group of the best Tanzanian writers. And because they wrote in Swahili, they didn't write in English. Uh, as far as Brent Linfors was concerned, they didn't exist. Um, the same thing that Chaban Robert was not invited to the African writers thing. If you take uh, Abdul Raza, Ghana again, you have a Zanzibari writer, or well, some people say you have to say a Tanzanian writer, a Zanzibari Tanzanian writer, Shafi Adam Shafi, who has written about the same things as Abdul Razak Ghana. Uh, the revolution, what happened after the revolution, books like Haini, Vute um, Nikuvute, Kasri um, Aminifad, and so on. But who knows about Shafi Adam Shafi? Because he writes in Swahili. But these are the African literatures which can be read by people in the countries where they are writing their works. I'm not devaluing the other ones. Chimamanda is one of my favorite writers. Kintu by Nansubuga is a brilliant novel to me. But we don't see these others. Eh? Then we have a third one, and again, Tanzania, this has been a debate for years and years and years about serious literature versus popular literature. Rewire that, not rewire pen Because there's an explosion of novels written by people who are not university professors in Tanzania in the 1980s, like Venom Tobwa, Kadubi, uh, so many. Hmm? And, and they, they wrote very good novels, and the themes of the novels were not really very different from the, the novels that were written um, by Kesla Habi and others. Uh, until Kesla Habi went on to write um, Nagona and Dingile, which then was in a different level altogether. Huh? We forget that that popular literature is really important, and it has a very important role to play. I may not agree entirely with some of the ways they are written and some of the conventions of detective novels or spy novels or romance novels. Uh, I may feel that the characterization is not what I would like it to be or whatever. But these books are popular and they are read and they create a reading culture and they contribute to literature. Is anyone here from Uaridi? Yay! One, two. Uwaridi, umoja wandishi wa riwaya ni maadili. How many novels have you produced now, Uwaridi? So how many altogether has Uwaridi contributed to producing? Roughly how many in terms of numbers, yeah? 30. 30 plus. And they're good. They're exciting. Um, they raise issues. Uh, they definitely stress suspense. You want to know what's going to happen by the end. And uh, they have their own way of supporting one another to publish these books. They contribute to one another to make sure that a book comes out. They can't afford to go to big publishers they publish themselves. They may start with a hundred copies. If it doesn't sell well, okay, that's the end of that one. But if it does sell well, then you can publish 200 copies or 300 copies. And in that way, they are creating a whole new 
class of, 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 of readers. That is part of African literature, but it's not very often remembered. Um, then, in a different line, you have un-African African writers. Eh? There is a whole genre now of LGBTQ literature. Hmm? I think mainly in Nigeria, but also in Kenya. Um, Binyavanga, Wainaina was a very good example. And yet, there would be a lot of people in this room who would say that that is not African. But they are African, and they are writing. And actually, they are writing some, some wonderful books. Eh? Uh, Amanzi, Amanzi, Akwaeke is another one from Nigeria. So, they are there. Eh? This is part of the diversity. You have the young adult literature, which again made a big difference in the 1980s. There was the Pace Setter series. Um, and if you talk to many people, they grew up on the Pace Setter novels before they moved on to, to other novels. Again, they were simple, exciting, funny, whatever. Um, uh, and then there is children's literature, uh, of which there is a lot, and there has been a big change. If you take Tanzania, for example, children's literature in the 1980s was incredibly boring. I think if I was a, a child at a Tanzanian primary school in the 1980s, I would never have become a reader, let alone a writer. Eh, one of my favorites was, Mr. and Mrs. Lemma uh, are very clean. Hmm? Mr. Lemma goes to work in the office. Uh, his wife uh, washes his clothes and irons his clothes. He is always clean. Okay, he's going to the office. Mrs. Lemma is a farmer. She is always clean. What kind of farmer is always clean? <laughs> uh, and so on. But there was a, again a reaction, which I'm happy as I was part of, to insist that interest was the key issue. So now we have a whole set of much more interesting and exciting children's books, and I'm sure that some of the children's writers are here. And now we have a, a, new, a new thing, which is children writers writing children. So who was uh, the one who was, I was given, her, I bought, I wasn't given, I bought her book. Can you raise your hand? Where? So I don't have the, someone has already stolen my copy. Eh? Um, there is another one who I was uh, fortunate to, uh, call Ramona, I was fortunate to be the guest of honor at the launching of her book. There's another one who has written a complete fantasy novel about lots of things. So now we have children writing literature. So the future is very, is very positive. But also, I have to say, the future is feminine. If you look at the vast majority of African writers who are known outside Africa as well, they are nearly all women starting with Chimamanda, um, um, ah, I forget them all, there are so many of them, uh, Yagyasi, uh, Amaeke, um, Sh Fela Shoinin, uh, and so on. Almost every novel you read nowadays, if you, if you, if you try and, I did, I'm not angry with the women, that's not why I hit this, um, is women. And I think this is brilliant, because we get a whole new... There was a very small generation at the beginning, like Flora Nwapa and Butya Mecheta, and Janao um, Balisidje here in Tanzania, and Panina Mlama, and a few others. Uh, but now, we are getting a whole new way of looking at the world. So, in that sense, the future of African literature is very bright, African literatures. The problem is, and I hope that Hermes will talk about this a bit, is we have plenty of fish, but no pond, particularly in Tanzania. But I think it's also true elsewhere. It is not easy to publish a book and get known by using a local publisher. It is not easy 
for the publisher to be able to make money, which he has to do in order to run his business, publishing for a local market for several reasons. Um, in Tanzania, the first reason, and I'm glad we have someone who has really developed the schools, because I'm going to make this point very strongly, the Tanzanian book trade has been killed, murdered, assassinated, bludgeoned to death by the current government policy, that all books have to be written by the Institute of Education. First of all, it is very unfair on the Institute of Education. They have to write or vet every book from every subject from preschool right up to um, colleges. That is an immense task. And nearly all of those who have to do it were not trained as writers. And not everyone can become a writer, I'm sorry. I don't believe everyone can become a writer. There is a certain element of naughtiness, of creativity, of ways of putting things which does not necessarily come into every person. And when you write committee books, you always end with the lowest common denominator. Because the writer will make a joke there, or give a sort of thing. And, so, and people say, yeah, and says, no, 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 that's against African culture. Or, no, 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 that's a stupid comment. No, no, no. Remove it, remove it, remove it, remove it. In the end, you end up with a very boring book. So it's not fair on the Institute of Education, it's not fair on our students, and it's not fair on the book trade. Because publishers in a, in a market which is not so big, uh, even the most popular newspaper only sells 10,000 copies, or maybe even less these days. And a book to reach 10,000 copies is amazing if it's not on the syllabus. Eh? Publishers depend on textbooks. Textbooks create the surplus which enables them to print other books which don't have a profit, and very often make a loss. And I am deeply in awe of some of our publishers, like my publisher, Hermes Damian here. Hmm? Uh, who publishes books, he knows perfectly well it's not going to make a profit. If you publish, for example, uh, a textbook for the university, how many, how many people are going to buy that book? But it's part of the contribution of the writer, of the publisher to society, uh, social entrepreneurship. Um, but if the, if the publishers can't contribute to the development of the textbooks and be able to sell their books, then it is very difficult for them to survive. And most publishers are now either dead or in the ICU. And uh, they can't afford the oxygen to carry on in the ICU either. Eh? It's very sad. Now, of course, the government has a responsibility to ensure that the books are, adhere to the syllabus, eh, are written properly, and so on. But they don't have to write all the books themselves to do it. And they themselves, several times they produce books and someone in Parliament stands up and points out there are so many mistakes in the books. And then uh, they are withdrawn and burnt. So, I don't know whether other countries have the same problem, but in Tanzania this is a serious problem uh, which impedes the development of African literature. Even Uaridi, hmm, if it was a different situation, they would be able to publish far more, far more copies of their books if there was more of an open market to enable them to do it. Eh? So, yes, there were problems in the previous system, but why couldn't we sort out the problems rather than just handing it all over to one side? Secondly, it's not just the Institute of Education. Eh? <coughs> the backup to supporting African literatures or Tanzanian literatures is very poor. A book is produced. No one knows it's been produced. Eh? No one's ever heard of it. Eh? I wrote this book, eh, a novel, Love Bombs, three years ago. How many people have heard of Love Bombs? You see, most of you don't have the faintest idea. Eh? 
John, he has written a novel. How many people have heard of his novel? What's it called? Catfish. Eh? Catfish. It can't be true. How many people have read or seen that it can't be true? Mm. How many people have read the novels of Hussein Tua? Hussein Tua? Ah, you guys, you don't count. Eh? <laughs> eh? Maundu Mengizi. Fabian Tanga. How many of you even heard of these guys? So the marketing of these books is very poor. There are no book reviews in most of the newspapers or even on social media. There are no um, programs on the television and the radio to talk about these books. There are no promotion uh, programs for these books and so on. So um, even if you manage to produce a really good book to get to get it read is very difficult. And the third issue is the protection of writers' rights. And for that I will speak for myself. Mabara La Palma has been quite a popular book. Um, and wherever I go, uh, people say, hey, Mabara La Palma. <laughs> but I get almost no money because the book has been pirated to death. They even caught one guy who had printed 10,000 copies of Mabara the farmer, for which he was fined 200,000 shillings. Um, so even if you manage to get a popular book, eh, you still won't necessarily benefit as a, as, as, as a writer. So this is the environment in which all these maize seeds that are sprouting is actually quite inimical to to what is required. Eh? But, again, with this new generation, you have a lot of creativity. Waridi, I mentioned. People are self-publishing. Um, people are, are developing blogs and online. Eh? And I was reading an article by the woman who started Brittle Paper. Who has read a Brittle Paper? Brittle Paper? Go into the internet. It's a wonderful website which has so many stories about the new books, analyses, opinions, interviewing the writers, and so on. You have uh, Kwani, although I think Kwani is no longer existing in Kenya. Is Kwani still there? You have Writivism in, in, in Uganda, which started as an entirely Ugandan thing, but now is for the whole of Africa. You have festivals like the Ake Festival, which is entirely online. Um, and then festivals in South Africa and elsewhere, and we have this conference here, which do help to spread. We're looking for different ways of getting the news out, but still it's a struggle. Hmm? And then you have many different kinds of poetry, and Sandra is one example. Ashram Trangi is an example from a long time ago. Oh, sorry, not so long ago, yeah, from uh, a few years ago, you know, 1980s, just a few years ago. Eh? Yeah, I remember Asha, she said they brought their poems to me, yes, and then Asha went there. And uh, it was quite a difficult audience. Eh? So she had this very powerful revolutionary poem about uh, going to support the freedom fighter. The freedom fighter said, I will go. He said, go. Yes, I will go. Go. So she was very courageous. She carried on until she finished the poem. Mm -hmm. But there are many ways in which poetry, I don't know, poetry seems to have gone down again. It came up about two or three years ago, and there were meetings and the, in the evening and so on, but I don't hear them so often. So these alternative forms are, are really important. I think I've, uh, my time is on, so just very briefly, what about drama? Drama has the same problem. In Kenya, I think they still have the National Theatre. I hope so. Um, but many countries, they don't have a national theatre. You can't keep a, a, a theatre company working full-time. You can't pay them, because there's not enough uh, support to be able to do it. So they have to depend on donors who tell them what they have to write about and what the message should be. So they become servants to the neo-colonial processes um, which govern all the other things that we have to deal with. Uh, in order to make ends meet. Of course you have movies, and uh, we all know Nigerian movies, yeah? Who has seen a Nigerian movie, eh? 
everybody. <laughs> and we have our own Tanzanian uh, movie uh, industry, but it needs a lot of development. So drama also has been, has been uh, marginalized. And then for poetry, I'm glad there are some musicians here, because uh, I think together with poems, songs are a really important part of what is going on. In the 1980s, we had uh, Sugu, or particularly to a too proud, now Professor Jay, and now we have people like uh, Neywan Tego, Roma, and others, um, who were the expression of the new generation, and they are the expression of the young people in the way they sing. We have the internationalization of song with Davido, Banaboy, and Platinum, and so on. And we even have a singer who got the Nobel Prize for Literature, Bob Dylan because he was seen as being a great poet, and I think he is actually. Yeah? So there's a lot of space for that, but, and probably that has a bit more um, sponsorship than, than others. So, overall, I am insisting that we have a lot of African literatures, often aimed at different groups in society or different classes, uh, can be in, Africa or out of Africa, but they still come from an African base and they still raise issues which are relevant to all of us. Chimamanda said when she wrote Purple Hibiscus, uh, some people are angry with her. They said, why do you show that all African fathers are abusers? You know, I showed that one African father was an abuser. I didn't say it all African. And again, this is the problem of, of generalizing this is why we need all these different affidavits to show that all these different things there are abusers and there are good fathers, eh? the whole lot of different people. But still, I think we do have to go back to the question which all writers should ask themselves and which Fanon said at the beginning. Every generation must, out of obscurity, find its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. Who are we writing for? Hmm? Who do we support? No, they say literature is a mirror of society. Society is a hundred different things. Do we write as a mirror of the ruling class and support it? Do we write to criticize? Do we write to expose areas which are not talked about? Because you point, Dennis Brutus had a poem, the mirror serves, the viewer sets the angle. So I can use the mirror to look at my face, or I might think that my trousers are falling down so I can point the mirror in that direction, or I want to look at whatever. So where is the writer pointing the mirror? and why and for whose benefit. That's why in Tanzania there was a lot of anger about the way all, nearly all, the artists came out in support of one party, which they have the right to do, but no criticism, no questioning, it was just praise singing. But then again, praise singing is a part of African culture. Hmm? Um, and there's a, uh, there's a wonderful poem which I can't find, but it's called Write What You Like. So he goes on, you write what you like, write about this, write about that, write... The blank page is really beautiful. So if you're going to write, you've got to make sure that what you write is actually more beautiful than the blank page. Write what you like. Yeah? And then Gitna Maze says, success in writing, success is writing something that creates a conversation or challenges a conversation that's already happening. I want to complicate my readers' assumptions about the world and force them to ask questions they never thought to ask. That, for me, is a breakthrough. And that goes to Ibsen. My job is not to give answers, my job is to ask questions. So my final quote, uh, quotation. Against Maza, it is precisely because there are so few novels back on writers in global circulation that we ask those novels to do too much. No one novelist can bear the burden of representing a constant, and no one novel should have to do to it. Those on it are more or less sociologically homogeneous, born, raised, or granted degrees by universities in the West, and now living in or between Western cities and African capitalists, capitals and capitalists. This is a problem. African books for global eyes must be written by a broader range of Africans 
including those writing in non-European languages. He has sporic nebulists such as Mengistu and Wangugi, Mukomo Wangugi, are doing wonderful work in bringing African writers who work in indigenous languages to global attention. With them, I share the heartbreak of Nya, Nyaobani's words. Some of the greatest African writers of my generation may never be discovered. And I wonder about Abdul Razak, if he hadn't left Zanzibar. He may have died a primary school teacher, we would never have heard of him. So it's very ironic that forcing him into exile actually exposed him to the possibility of becoming a better known writer. But as Benoukri says, make no mistake about it, African literature is taking over the world. It has sprouted from Africa, but it has grown in all corners of the globe. It is a literature of the native lands, it is also a literature of sensibility, of exile, of migration, of travel, of home leaving, home staying, home coming. It is a literature that can no longer be contained in a continent. All by a school, or a name, it is a literature of all schools, of new schools without a name, a reinvention of the past, a transmutation of the storytelling earth. Many thanks. <laughs>